This is Kyle Grenham with Grandin Media. We're here today with uh, His Grace, Archbishop Richard Smith of the Archdiocese of Edmonton. Uh, we're looking to get his perspective on the state of our Archdiocese in 2019. Thank you for joining us, Your Grace. Now, first of all, uh, as we look back over 2019, uh, what stands out for you? Well, um, over this past year and beginning prior to this past year, I undertook a, a series of visits to our parishes. Um, so we've been going through a, a series um, of setting aside uh, weekend after weekend after weekend, whereby I can get out into the parish, celebrate mass with the people, um, usually have a question and answer session with the parishioners afterwards, um, usually meeting with the pastoral council, with the pastor, with any of the committees that they may want, want me to meet with and so on. And I've just enjoyed that no end. Um, I, I love to just to contact and to touch base with the people in the parishes. It's really important for me to know a couple of things. So the various diocesan initiatives or the various things that I might be saying through homilies and so on, or the various teachings of the church as they're being expounded in response to various issues that are arising in society. It's important to know how that's landing in the minds and in the hearts of our people. So the pastoral visit offers me an opportunity really for a check-in and, and see how they're doing really. There's nothing more important than celebrating the Eucharist together, so we do that first. And to see how the Eucharist is celebrated in, in different ways throughout the Archdiocese, especially when I get into um, parishes that are linguistically based or ethnically based or whatever, being with First Nations people is always a real joy. Uh, how, to, to see how it's one and the same Mass, it's one and the same faith, and yet there can be nuances uh, depending on the circumstances. And it's beautiful to experience that and to see that. And then afterwards to have the Q&A. And uh, I get everything. I get all kinds of questions thrown at me, which is great. This is what I've asked for. And people aren't shy. And that helps by hearing the questions that I'm saying, okay, here's, here's where maybe we need a little bit more teaching, a little bit more clarification and so on. Um, Meeting with the pastoral councils, that gives me a more, uh, a closer look at the details of uh, concerns around parish life itself, whether it's temporal issues around the roof or the furnace, or, but also pastoral issues, how do we reach out to our youth in the area is, is a common concern. But just to be able to sit down and engage with people, find out where they are, how I can help them with the archbishop, as the archbishop, how the archdiocese can be of support to them. I, I just find that um, a real joy. And it's something that, is, that has uh, marked this whole past year in a way that I'm very grateful for. So referring back to your pastoral letter, uh, Living in the Word of God, in what areas has there been progress and what are some of the challenges you see that lie ahead? Well, we've been at the pastoral letter now for a couple of years, in year three, and, and just to remind everybody, um, this is something that was written in response uh, to the call from Pope Francis himself to the whole church to undergo pastoral conversion. And we had uh, brought together a group of people that reflected upon what that might mean. And we reflected for quite a long time, I'd say over a year. And as we realized more and more that conversion arises out of encounter with the person of Christ, and that Christ is the Word of God incarnate, uh, that we said, let's, let's focus upon helping our Catholic people be more centered upon living in the Word of God. That's the title of the letter. And what does that, what does that mean? So we picked up, and again, this was from Pope Francis himself, we picked up the teaching of Jesus, that if we want to be his disciple, it means hearing the Word of God and doing it. So the letter has that twofold structure, uh, what it means to hear the Word of God, and it, it proposes different ideas about how that can happen in a person's life, and then what it means to do the Word of God, which is a threefold activity in the life of the Catholic Church, uh, worship, witness, and service. So we've been implementing it now. The, the plan is to implement the letter, to have each element of the letter launched so that it can carry on into the future, but launching it over a five-year period 
in these this first two years, we're into the third now, the first two years, we're focusing upon hearing the Word of God. And so we invited the parishes, we invited families, we invited individuals, we invited our institutions to consider um, how they might do that in their respective contexts. I, I have a sense, I don't know exactly where in every instance it has been unfolding and, and how, but I have a sense that people have responded to that. So for example, whenever I'm in meetings, whether it's here at the pastoral center, gatherings with priests or whatever, people are instinctively beginning their meeting by picking up the, the Bible and reading a passage of scripture, usually the gospel assigned for the day or something. I noticed that in our educational institutions, a lot of the meetings begin with a period of Lectio Divina. I'm not sure how, obvious, I'm not sure how it would be unfolding in families, but I, I have a sense that it's gradually catching on as something that we need to do. And I do make it the center point of my homilies whenever I undertake pastoral visits. I've been visiting parishes throughout the diocese the last couple of years. Uh, people who hear me speak about this often, I'm sure they're thinking of me as a, as a broken record, but I want to really drive home the point that there are so, so many different voices, messages on offer out there that can lead us in all sorts of different directions, many of which are not all that great if we listen to them. We really need to be focused upon the one voice and the one word that's trustworthy, and that's the word of Almighty God incarnate in Jesus, recorded for us in the scriptures, handed down to us through the teaching of the church and so on. And I would hope that the more we continue to get into the practice of centering everything we do, beginning everything we do, by focusing upon the Word of God and allowing that to guide us, the more I hope that that will uh, really take deeper root in the hearts of, of our people. The challenge, you asked challenge, uh, I guess the challenge grows out of what I just said. We live in a, again, this is a frequent term that I use, we live in a tsunami of noise, babble, chatter, and hard really to figure out in the midst of all of that, what's good, what's bad, what's right, what's wrong. Uh, it comes at us all the time, and to develop the discipline, to put that aside and to focus upon God's Word, that, that is a challenge that I think that faces all of us. Time pressures are so strong, the, the pressures of distraction in the mind and in the heart are so strong to act against that. But we need to keep the message up from here that this is of critical importance to all of us for our life of faith. Uh, if we can deal with that and transcend that particular challenge, then I think we've made uh, extraordinary headway in this, in this endeavor. We're now in year three, which means we've moved to uh, the doing phase. So having heard the Word of God, how do we do it? And we're dedicating one year for each of the three ways in which the church structures her life around the doing, worship, witness, service. So here for the year worship, what I want to focus upon here, and Grandin Media is going to be a big help to me here because we, we want to do some outreach and some catechesis based on some video conversations with people around different aspects of the mystery of worship. And what we hope to get at in this process is not so much the how-to of celebrating liturgy. By and large, that's already very, very well done in the Archdiocese, I'm glad to say. But the what of it, the essence of it, what does it mean really to worship, to, to unite the entirety of my life to the self-offering of Christ that happens in the Eucharist from the altar, offering his life to the Father for the life of the world and drawing us into a participation in that self-offering by making our self-gift part of his, and all of the implications of that for our life and for our engagement of the world and so on. Those are, those are rather profound um, questions that we do need to grapple with. And so by a video-based conversation interview approach, I hope to be able to do that. And we'll, we'll get, we're thinking it through right now, but we'll get uh, launched on that, I think, uh, more effectively in, in the new year. The economy in Alberta is not doing well right now. Uh, the Archdiocese had finished 2018 with a deficit of almost 450,000. Um, at the same time, uh, the Archdiocese had decided to renovate two summer camps at an estimated cost of $5 million. Um, Your Grace, why are the camps important? And in this economic climate, how will you persuade people to support this project? Hmm. 
Uh, it seems to be that whenever we undertake uh, fundraising efforts in this archdiocese and seek people, it always seems to be in, in a moment of economic decline. We've been dealing with that on a whole host of different issues for a number of years here, beginning when I first arrived with the need to raise funds for the new seminary in the college. And yet, you know, in spite of the difficulties, and I realize that they're real, everybody's going through belt tightening, uh, people, when they appreciate the importance of the particular institution, they rise to the occasion. The, the people of the Archdiocese love the church. They love the mission of the church. They want to be part of it. Um, and when they see institutions that are so critical to the unfolding of that mission, they've shown themselves ready to, to step forward and provide us with what we need. That's what gives me the confidence as we move into particular fundraising for the camps. Now, just again as a reminder, we had to put a moratorium on the camps for a little while, sort of a pause and reflect, because they had been undergoing some operational deficits. And when I dug into that a little bit more deeply, we found from some engineering studies that we needed, we had an infrastructure deficit too, if I could put it that way. We needed to invest some capital to bring current um, facilities up to speed, or to get rid of facilities that really pass their expiry date, um, to consider some new facilities and so on. And um, that would involve, as an initial estimate, some pretty significant capital dollars. So at that point I said, okay, let's take a, a look at this, pause, and um, find out what the mind of the people is. So we put out a survey. First of all, to the key stakeholders, those that had been a lot, for a long time been invested in the life of the camps. And the response coming back was just overwhelming. We need these camps. They have provided such a beautiful venue for our young people to be solidified in the faith, more deeply grounded in the faith, such that the renewed faith coming out of their camp experience carries through with them into adulthood. Uh, so, having heard that and received that feedback, it, it was very, very clear to me that we need to find a way to keep these moving. And so, I asked people here in my offices to come up with a business plan, taking into account all the, the feedback that we received. What's this going to look like? And so, they they've made a proposal to me, which will make clear to the Archdiocese pretty soon, I should think, a plan that can unfold, say, over five to ten years that does envision the use of both of the camps that we've had. Um, right now, we're probably looking at needing five million dollars to do everything that we would want to do. That will be entirely uh, coming from donors. That's, that's the kind of the way that we'll have to approach this. But given what I've seen in the past number of years from the people concerning their commitment to the mission of the church in the Archdiocese, and especially given what I've heard back from the deep commitment of many, many people to the camps and their importance for our young people and for families and so on, I think that even in the midst of economic difficulties, people out of their love and out of that conviction of the necessity of the camps will... Um, will rise to the occasion again. I don't think it's going to need a lot of convincing from me. Uh, I think people were afraid that perhaps because of the moratorium, I was the one that needed to be convinced about the necessity of the camps. I didn't need to be, but it was certainly uh, heartwarming and edifying to hear this deep and broad uh, level of support that exists among the people here for the camps. So I, I've got a lot of confidence around this. Um, the issue of conscious rights was front and center, particularly here in Alberta recently. Uh, there was a private member's bill to protect the conscious rights of healthcare professionals, uh, passed by Catholic MLA Dan Williams. Now, um, a second reading of the bill was uh, voted down and it caused a bit of controversy. Um, why should we as Catholics be concerned about this issue of conscious rights? Um. I guess the first thing that I'd want to say, just observing the way that that all unfolded, and of course I don't have the inside track on how things might have been unfolding within the legislature and all the political dynamics around it and so on. I was paying attention more to what was being said about the issue uh, on the part of those that were debating it, certainly in the way that it was reported in the media. And it seems to me the first thing we'd have to grapple with is that I'm not so sure that everybody understands what the issue is. I don't think everybody understands really what we mean by conscience. 
what I was hearing was an understanding of conscience as if it were a matter of subjective opinion or of beliefs or whatever, personal beliefs. And you see that, for example, in the way that in some media reports, they framed the issue as a, as a debate between beliefs versus rights. And when I read that, I said, I, don't, I think we're missing the point here. Conscience is far deeper than this. Conscience is not personal opinion. Conscience is not subjective feeling. Conscience is an inalienable aspect of the human being. It's, a, it's an innate, and we would say God-given capacity that the human person um, can make a judgment in any given situation as to what must be done. Not what I would like to do, but what I ought to do or must do so that my actions are in accord with objective truth truth, not following out of subjective feeling. And when we understand conscience in that way, then we realize that freedom is absolutely necessary for its full and proper exercise. Um, and our Charter of Rights recognizes this. Um, it recognizes it by placing freedom of conscience, freedom of religion, right at the very, very top of the list of basic human rights that need to be protected. So there are a significant number of people who in that debate show that they understand conscience and the way that they stepped up to the plate to speak in favor of this particular private member's bill. At the same time, others engaging the debate, I'm not so sure they really got what is at stake here. So we're going to have to monitor this and see how it all unfolds. And one of the reasons I think, a clear reason, and again, this is just on the basis of my observation, uh, this debate unfolded with particular reference to uh, healthcare professionals and protecting their right to the freedom of conscience. So I do think we need to monitor this. One of the things that I was observing in the whole debate is that it unfolded with a particular reference to healthcare professionals, the protection of their freedom of conscience, and so on. And we do have already in the province a status quo which is good. It balances these rights that are there in such a way that um, a healthcare professional can, in fact, uh, exercise freedom of conscience, even as it involves the question of referral in a way that really would be respective of, of that right. The bill, as I understood it, was simply to enshrine in legislation this, the good status quo that already exists. If people were um, arguing against the bill, it made me wonder, now this would need to be tested, but it made me wonder if in fact a deeper motivation was the, the hope actually to challenge and to change the status quo. Uh, that is not something that we could stand for and we would need to be able to speak up against that. But the, the, the fundamental issue that I was observing in all of this was the, a proper understanding of conscience itself. The more we understand what that is, then I think the more we would all embrace the obvious need to protect the full freedom of its, of its exercise. Um, this past year we saw a change in government at the provincial uh, and at the federal level. Uh, here in Alberta we had a change from the NDP to a United Conservative majority. Um, should, in your view, uh, we as Catholics be more politically involved and how so? Well, I th the Church would always say that we need to be politically involved and that can take a number of different forms. Um, we understand that politics is a noble profession. I mean, people are stepping forward to be public servants of the common good in a, in a particular political and, and legislative environment, and we need to encourage them for that. And our own people, growing out of our, our social teaching and the desire to be positive contributors to the common good, our own people are called to look very, very seriously at that as a, as a vocation for their lives if God has in fact gifted them with the capacity to do so. That's one area of political involvement. The, the more common one, obviously, is to be involved in the political process by our choice of uh, those who are going to be representing us in political office. 
getting out and voting and everything else. But not just the ballot box. There's also that dimension whereby we need to keep an eye on what is coming out of the legislative process. Are the proposed bills, our current legislation, are they in fact serving the common good? Um, are they in fact advocating and serving the needs of the poor and the disadvantaged and so on? Uh, we, we need to be monitoring all of that and where from a perspective of our faith tradition, we see areas that do need to be challenged, where our leaders need to be called to account, um, we need to step, be prepared to step forward and, and do just that. We consider that living in a liberal democracy is a great blessing because it comes with the freedom to do just that, to be politically engaged in all the different ways that that can happen. And the church is very, very concerned to encourage uh, all of us to do just that. Uh, are you concerned that Albertans, uh, young people in particular, are turning away from organized religion? Uh, there have been studies that suggest that uh, people are interested in principles of faith like charity and solidarity with poor and disadvantaged, but they're not drawn to uh, specific faith groups themselves. Mm. Uh, how would you assess this subject and the evangelization efforts of the Archdiocese? Well, I'd, I'd assess it on the basis of my own observation, but not just that, but on the basis also of some encounters that I have had with young people. And, and yes, of course, there are some that have uh, turned away and are continuing to turn away from organized religion, and that has to be a concern for all of us. At the same time, I'm meeting a lot of young people that are moving in the opposite direction, that are feeling the lack of some kind of clear moral reference points, uh, sort of a parameters to, of a worldview of understanding uh, within which they can find meaning and within, within which they can operate in accordance with certain uh, standards of belief, um, standards of understanding, and so on. The dynamic of young people, and not just young people leaving, leaving organized religion, leaves me wondering what they understand religion is to begin with. Over the last number of decades, I think it's fair to say that for a whole host of reasons, religion has been reduced simply to personal sentiment. Religion is a matter of, of feeling, of and out of that feeling, seeking to do good for the other. But if it is simply a matter of personal sentiment, then, then why would I need a community of like-minded people? Why would I need um, a system of dogmas and beliefs and, and everything else to which I would be holding my life account and so on, to account? Um, so I think a lot of it is this very, very um, inaccurate understanding of what religion is. We understand religion as, as a world view a way of understanding the world, of seeing all things from a particular perspective, a worldview that grows out of an encounter with a person. That person is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, who is God, who became a human being. And we say, because of that, this is central to the teaching of the Second Vatican Council, that because of who Jesus is, we can discover in him the truth about God, as well as the truth about the human being. If God has fashioned all that is, then it is in Him, in God, that we will discover the explanation of all things. And we'll learn that we don't have to figure things out entirely on our own. We have the gift of God's self-revelation above all in Jesus Christ. We have the gift of reason the church really honors that we can bring to all the data of nature, of creation, of revelation, and through that um, come to an understanding of the truth of what is. But we also understand that you cannot, you cannot do that alone. You need to be able to benefit from collective wisdom, a wisdom that is brought together not just in one same moment of time, but the wisdom that has been collected over time, and in the case of Christianity, has been collected over millennia. 
how, how could we ignore that? And so this wisdom, a wisdom which is a process of reflection upon the person of Jesus Christ and all that has come to us in Jesus Christ about the truth of nature, the truth of the human being, the truth of God, this reflection has over time allowed the church to come to some moments of very, very clear understanding such that she is able to encapsulate that understanding in formula, in doctrine, in dogma, uh, helping us to see clearly how we ought to live if we are to live in accordance with the truth of things that has come to us in Jesus Christ. And when we live in accordance with the truth of things, when we live in a way that we conform our life to the truth that we discover around us rather than to the truth that I'm trying to figure out within me, then, and it sounds so paradoxical in our culture, then we discover really what it means to be free, to be liberated. And so religion, properly understood, is not a, just simply a set of rules and dogmas and everything else that kind of confines us. It's a worldview that, said, that speaks truth clearly, but in such a way that makes everything so clear that it liberates and it frees. And I've discovered that verified in the lives of young adults who have come. I remember meeting with a group of young people at one of our universities here in Edmonton, and they were talking about the terror and the anxiety that they feel at being told that they have to figure everything out on their own. You don't need religion. You don't need ties to family, to tradition, to previous understanding. You're, you're self-creating, figure it all out. And they're saying, no, 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 that, that's leaving us terrified because we've got no, no reference points. And some of those same people have looked to the church with the tradition, with its parameters, with its liturgy, with the transcendence that is experienced there. They say, no, here we're, we're discovering that we discover the truth of ourselves precisely within this community defined as a religion. We don't have to figure it out. We're part of a story far, far bigger than ourselves, which is, which is extraordinarily liberating. So, so it, when I reflect upon all of that and then see people turning away from what they call organized religion, you want to say, oh, you're missing the point here and you're missing out on something wonderful, beautiful, true, and liberating. And we'd like to help you understand really what we mean by religion and all that it does to help us discover the truth, what it is to live as a human being in relationship with God and the, the freedom and the joy and the peace that comes from that. Uh, an Angus Reid poll in May showed that more than half of practicing Catholics indicated that the church has done a poor or a very poor job in handling the sexual abuse crisis. And uh, recently the Archdiocese of Vancouver had released the names of nine priests who had been uh, either convicted or named in lawsuits. Uh, how will the Archdiocese of Edmonton continue to address this issue? I think the first thing that we'd have to say about this issue prior to talking about what the Archdiocese has done in response to it is just how tragic this is. This is tragic, well, tragic beyond words, really. Um, first of all, for any victim of abuse, especially at the hands of a priest. That's unimaginable, but it has happened. And we have to deal with that and surround the victim with whatever love, support, etc. That, that we can. Um, over the years, uh, psychologists have helped us to understand just how deep the damage is and life-changing and how it, it lasts throughout life, the, the consequences of this. And so, so we have to be attentive to the individual. And because of the horror that's involved here, the church can never be complacent in, in that in thinking that perhaps her response is sufficient. We can never be complacent about that. We have been working at this in the Archdiocese. The Church in Canada has been working at this for many, many years now. Um, 
largely through uh, making sure we've got policies and protocols in place that govern how we will, first of all, receive a victim, listen to the victim, surround them with whatever support is necessary, but also to help us to be, to be very, very sure that we will deal um, decisively and with dispatch whenever we do, God forbid, uh, get an allegation of abuse towards anybody who's been vulnerable. So we've been working at all those policies and protocols to make sure that those are in place. But together with that, we realize it's, this, is, this is a lot more than just policies and protocols. We want to make sure that all of our church environments are safe places. And so we've, for a number of years, been working at our whole Safe Environments Initiative. All of our volunteers, everybody who's involved in ministry must at least take a minimum amount of training so that they are aware of all the different ways in which we can be working together to protect the vulnerable in our midst. It's called called to protect, and we are in fact that, called to protect. One of the issues that has been uh, arising lately with respect to the church's response to this issue has to do with her credibility and trustworthiness, because in many ways these issues have been badly mishandled, and that has um, been made rather well known, you know, through media reports and so on. That's not a complaint, by the way. I think these, this is an area where as uncomfortable as it is, the church needs the light of the media. The, the light helps us to see uh, where all the dark shadows are that we need to get out of the church and make sure that uh, uh, we're healing and that we're acting appropriately and so on. But because of all that light, the question of the church's credibility and trustworthiness has come up, especially at the level of the bishop. So we had um, decided a few years ago now, back in 2011, I think it was, to engage with an outside party, a third party, objective organization that has expertise in safe environments, in responding to allegations of abuse and so on, to come in and take a look at how we do things here, not just take a look, but help us move forward to get to a place where we would meet their standards, their objective standards, even to the point of being formally accredited by them that yes, this church is doing whatever the latest is that we need to be doing here in the Archdiocese to have safe environments to care for victims, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And we achieved that accreditation and the they have to continue to hold our feet to the fire to make sure we maintain the accreditation. And that's done through periodic audits. The point of all that is to say, we recognize that it's not just enough for me as the Archbishop or for the Archdiocese of Edmund to say, look folks, trust us, we are doing everything that we can. It's important to show that we can have that objectively verified. And uh, so through this organization, which is called Presidium, we are able to do just that. It's an ongoing journey. Um, we continue to reflect upon this. We have a special committee that's been in place for quite some time, has just been updated, and it's a group that uh, even in absent any allegations, I can still go with questions, get, get good advice and so on as to what is the best way that we can continue to make our diocese the safest place possible for all of our people? What more can we be doing to make sure that victims feel that they can come here um, that they will receive a listening ear, that they will be believed, that we will walk with them. Everything that I would want to communicate to an individual. Um, it's good to have things like Presidium. It's good to have uh, this, this community that we have that can continue to give me that advice that we need. Um, maybe this is a vague question or a loaded question. I'm not <laughs> sure. Uh, uh, as Archbishop of Edmonton, what keeps you up at night? <laughs> Um, well, I'll give you a, a straight, honest answer, and I don't mean to be glib. I mean it. Uh, nothing keeps me up at night. Nothing keeps me awake. It's not to say I don't have a lot of things flowing through my head. Of course I do. And we have to deal with a lot of issues, um, a lot, the solutions to which are not always immediately apparent. And until you come to a resolution as to how we're going to deal with whatever the issue might be, that, that can weigh on the mind quite a bit. At the end of the day, though, 
um, we're a people of faith. And by that I mean, we hold to the fidelity of Jesus to his promises. And he promised always to be with his church. And the church lives in a, I'll say for now, an organic unity with, with Jesus, a mystical unity of Jesus. He's the head. We are members of the body. Um, and so the Lord is always at work in and through the church to bring things to completion in accord with the will of the Father, in accord with the ultimate good of his people, of the church, and so on. Um, long before problems come to my attention, the Lord is aware of them. Long before I figure out any kind of a solution, the Lord knows what it is. And by the agency of the Holy Spirit, he's working through all the different um, relationships, all the different debates, all the different quandaries, all the different questions, working through all of that to bring things forward to a conclusion that he knows is right and good for the church. And so precisely because the Lord is in charge, and not just in charge, but also active in his church and in his people, I just, I just know that whatever it is, he's got it, right? And he's going to be carrying this all through. So at the end of the day, I just say, Lord, I can only do so much. And even what I can do is already your gift. I've got nothing personal to offer to this. It's only what you give me. It's only what you give your people. And so I give this back to you, trusting that you're handling this. That's, that's what faith is. Uh, very often people will quote John the 23rd, you know, at the end of the day, he'd say, okay, Lord, it's your church. I'm going to sleep. But, but there's a profound truth in that. It is the Lord's church. He'll never abandon us and he'll always lead us where we need to go. Sometimes that leading us is through some rather dark, challenging circumstances and times. And he promised no less than that. But if he's with us, well, it's right with the scripture. We don't need to be afraid at all. And the Archbishop, you often deal with very serious issues and I'm sure stressful issues many times as well. Uh, was there a favorite moment of levity or inspiration over this past year? Well, I'll go to inspiration. A favorite moment of inspiration. I had the great opportunity, it was an extraordinary blessing, of making a personal retreat at uh, the Shrine of Our Lady of Guadalupe in Mexico City. That was uh, at the beginning of the year, actually. And I hadn't been. And I, I know that Our Lady of Guadalupe is patroness of the Americas, the whole Western hemisphere. She's the, the star of the new evangelization and, and so on. And so uh, the people of the Americas, including yours truly, have a special devotion to her. So finally, I, I had this opportunity to go. And it, when you're there, of course, the shrine, it's an opportunity to review the story of her apparition to St. Juan Diego and See how that's all unfolding in all the different aspects of, of the shrine that are there. But there's one line that the Blessed Mother spoke to Juan Diego that jumped out at me and which in fact is recorded, encapsulated right on the facade of the basilica itself. Am I not here who am your mother? Am I not here who am your mother? Mary's our mother. Uh, Yes, Mother of God, the August Mother of God. Yes, we hold her in great, great awe and esteem and wonder. Of course we do. At the same time, she's Mother of the Church. She's our Mother. And her love towards us and her engagement with us is precisely that of a mother. So, am I not here? Yes, we trust that Mary is with us. With that maternal love guiding us, protecting us, and, and leading us always um, ever more close, ever more closely in union with her son Jesus. That that I mean, these are things that instinctively I've always known, of course, and all Catholics know. It's part of her Catholic DNA to have a special love and devotion to the Blessed Mother. Uh, but, but that stuck out at me. So again, I did go back to your previous question about you know what might I fear, keep me awake at night. So so obviously, first and foremost, the Lord's in charge. But we also have a mother, a mother who's with us and caring for us. And uh, she, neither will she abandon her children or let us down. So uh, that, was a, that was a great moment for me. 
Um, and what are you looking forward to in 2020? I'm looking forward to the Lord's surprises. Now, what do I mean by that? God, you know, all through the scriptures, but especially in Jesus, uh, showed that he's faithful to us. God is faithful to his people. Whatever he promises to do, he will do. But God, we know, acts most often in ways that surprise us. Because we, we have a tendency to develop certain expectations of the way that God will work or ought to work and so on. But his ways are so far beyond ours, of course. And so God, as he exercises his fidelity to us, usually manifests it in ways that catch us off guard, help us to see things differently. But again, even in doing that, um, assure us that he's with us. Don't be afraid. Carry on. I'm with you. I'm guiding you and so on. So I, I, just, I just find it so wondrous that God is close, that even the smallest detail of my life, or of anybody's life, is, is, is outside his, no, nothing is outside his sphere of concern. Nothing is outside his gaze. He sees all, and he's involved in all, even the smallest details. And those moments when we can see it, when we can feel it, when we can experience it, especially when it is surprising in ways that we would have never expected, Okay, Lord, yeah, you are faithful, you are in charge, and it's just these continual invitation again and again to ever deeper surrender in trust to that rock-solid fidelity of our God. Um, he's always surprising me, and he's always surprising us, and so I'm looking forward to seeing what that's going to look like in 2020. Well, thank you for joining us, Your Grace. You're uh, very, very welcome. Hope you have a Merry Christmas and a and Happy to you. New Year. And to you. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to see more material from Grandin Media, please subscribe to our YouTube channel or check out our website, grandinmedia.ca.